Good morning, and welcome to the fourth quarter conference call for Graco Inc. If you wish to access the replay for this call, you may do so by dialing 855-859-2056 within the United States or Canada. The dial-in number for international callers is 404-537-3406. The conference ID number is 516 516- Two six five nine. The replay will be available through 2 p.m. Eastern Time, Tuesday, February 2nd, 2021. Graco has additional information available in the PowerPoint slide presentation, which is available as part of the webcast player. At the request of the company, we will open the conference up for questions and answers after the opening remarks from management. During this call, Various remarks may be made by management about the expectations, plans, and prospects for the future. These remarks constitute forward-looking statements for the purposes of the safe harbor provisions of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act. Actual results may differ materially from those indicated as a result of various risk factors, including those identified in Item 1A of the company's 2019 Annual Report on Form 10-K and an Item 1A of the company's most recent quarter report on Form 10-Q. These reports are available on the company's website at www.greco.com and the SEC's website at www.sec.gov. Looking forward statements reflect management's current views and speak only as of the time they are made. The company undertakes no obligation to update these statements in light of the new information or future events. I will now turn the conference over to Kathy Schoenrock, Executive Vice President, Corporate Controller. Good morning. I'm here today with Pat McHale and Mark Sheehan. Our conference call slides have been posted on our website and provide additional information that may be helpful. Sales totaled $470 million this quarter, an increase of 14% from the fourth quarter last year, and an increase of 12% at consistent translation rate. Net earnings totaled $115 million for the quarter, or $0.66 cents per diluted share. After adjusting for the impact of excess tax benefits from stock option exercises, net earnings totaled $106 million, or $0.61 cents per diluted share. Gross margin rates increased 130 basis points from last year's fourth quarter. Realized pricing and foreign currency were favorable in the quarter. Mix was also favorable as we saw the margin impact of sales growth in our higher margin industrial segment more than offset the continued strength in our lower margin contractor segment. Operating expenses increased $7 million in the fourth quarter as compared to a year ago due to increases in sales and earnings-based expenses and higher product development costs. The reported income tax rate was 11% for the quarter, down 5 percentage points from last year, primarily due to an increase in tax benefits related to stock option exercises. After adjusting for the effect of stock option exercises, our tax rate for the quarter was 18%, slightly lower than the fourth quarter last year, due to additional foreign income taxed at lower rates. Cash flows from operations totaled $131 million in the fourth quarter and $394 million for the full year. Discretionary cash outflows in the quarter included the final repayment of $125 million of the $250 million borrowed on the revolving credit facility in the first quarter. We also made a voluntary contribution of $20 million to our U.S. pension plan. For the full year 2020, dividends paid totaled $117 million and capital expenditures were $71 million. A few comments as we look forward to 2021. Based on current exchange rates and the same volume and mix of products and sales by currency, the effect of exchange is currently expected to benefit sales by 2% and earnings by 6% for the full year, with the most significant impact coming in the first half. Unallocated corporate expenses are projected to be $30 million and can vary by quarter. The effective tax rate for the year is expected to be 18 to 19%. Capital expenditures are expected to be $115 million 
including $80 million for facility expansion projects. We may make share repurchases in 2021 via opportunistic open market transactions or short dated accelerated share repurchase programs. Finally, 2021 will be a 53 week year with the extra week occurring in the fourth quarter. I'll turn the call over to Pat now for further comments. Thank you, Kathy. Good morning, everyone. All of my comments this morning will be on an organic constant currency basis. The second quarter in a row, the contractor segment exceeded 30% growth and ended the year with record sales and earnings. Contractor grew in all regions during the quarter and for the year. Residential construction activity remains solid and the home improvement market robust. Contractor North America saw strong out the door sales in both Pro Paint and Home Center and we continue to work hard to maintain adequate channel inventory. The industrial segment grew mid single digits for the quarter but still ended the year down 10%. Compared to the previous three quarters, activity improved in some key end markets like spray foam, electronics, and battery. Access to industrial facilities remains limited, but quoting activity has improved. The Asia Pacific region was up versus last year's Q4, which was particularly weak. Price realization, solid factory performance, and good expense management combined with improved sales resulted in strong industrial operating earnings for the quarter. Process segment sales declined 10% for both the quarter and the year. A number of markets in our process segment remain challenged, particularly those related to the vehicle lubrication or oil and gas sectors. Heading into 2021, we expect challenging end market conditions to remain in place in our industrial and process segments for at least the first half of the year as lockdowns persist and access to customers remains limited. Our outlook for the contractor segment remains positive as favorable conditions continue and demand has been solid to start the year. Thanks to our outstanding employees, suppliers, and distributor partners, we were able to keep our factories and distribution centers fully operational, avoid layoffs and wage reductions, and fully invest in our core long-term growth strategies of new product development, channel expansion, and new markets. A special thanks is in order to our contractor employees and the employees from other factories who relocated to the contractor factory to assist with the large demand spike in the second half. From the sales team to the shop floor, the contractor team worked incredibly long hours, maintained a positive attitude, and were committed to doing whatever it took to get the job done. Culture matters, and they are winners. We exited the year with momentum and look forward to the fight again this year. Operator, we're ready for questions. Thank you. <clears throat> the question and answer session will begin at this time. Your question will be taken in the order that it is received. Please stand by for your, for, for your first question. Our first question will come from the line of Dean Dre from RBC Capital Markets. You may begin. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Hey, good morning, Dean. Hey, can we start in contractor? Um, just a couple things. One is, what's the visibility beyond the, the six weeks average orders that you're giving, which we appreciate? Um, but just what are kind of the, the data points that you're using, you say you expect to stay robust, that, you know, um, line of sight into that? And then also you called out some mix issues in uh, the segment. Maybe you can clarify that too, please. So it's a book and bill business, so we're always interested every week in what's happening with incoming order rates. However, when you take a look at the macro, uh, residential construction looks like it's going to remain uh, in pretty good shape through 2021, so we expect to um, capitalize on that. And at least currently, uh, what we're hearing and what we're seeing, there doesn't appear to be a big pullback in what's happening with the uh, home center's work from home business. So we feel like based upon the orders to start the year and what we're hearing in the marketplace, that we've got a good shot of uh, having a successful year in contractor, despite the fact that we do have some very tough comps that we're going to be up against uh, as we get into the, the peak that we hit uh, this year. In terms of the mix issue on contractor, typically that's just a mix issue between selling more of the smaller units uh, than the larger units uh, or home center business versus propane. All right, that's helpful. 
And then just as a follow-up, can you clarify for us uh, on what the opportunity is in batteries? I mean, when we talk to our auto analysts, he keeps emphasizing all the, um, the growth in batteries uh, and capacity that's coming on new technologies. And just remind us uh, where and how does Graco play in that market? Uh, yeah, Dean, it's Mark, and we play in our industrial segment in areas where customers are putting in new battery facilities and they're looking to use, you know, fluid compounds to either do bonding of various components of the batteries themselves, or we also get involved in what's called thermal interface materials, which are highly reactive um, abrasive materials that are put down to dissipate heat when batteries are actually being used. And we have the equipment and the expertise to get involved in those applications along with our distributor partners to put together nice packages uh, for the end users. So as long as there's you know, demand for batteries, uh, we expect that we're going to get a fair shot at being able to be involved in those opportunities. Got it. And if I can just squeeze one more uh, question in, can you talk about pricing expectations uh, I know it's at the beginning of the year is when you put through pricing. Um, what uh, are the dynamics this year and anything, contribution from new products you expect to launch? Thanks. Yeah, pricing ought to be like it is typically. Uh, you know, we generally put through a modest price increase each year and expect to realize somewhere in that one and a half, uh, maybe up to 2% uh, realized pricing. And I don't think this year is going to be uh, really anything different on that. Um, we did not cut any of our new product investments or our new product programs. Uh, so we feel like our new product pipeline uh, for 21 and even going into 22 looks pretty good. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will come from the line of Sari Boroditsky from Jeffries. You may begin. Good morning. Morning. We're, we're hearing that there's a lot of capital being spent on automation in China right now. Could you comment on what you're seeing there that drove the pickup in industrial? And then do you think that COVID will increase the demand for more automation in factories globally? So there's a lot of talk about COVID increasing the demand for automation. I think we saw the demand for automation trend. That, you know, that's been a multi-year trend. That's really nothing new. Well, will it add a little bit of juice to the fire for some folks? I suppose that it probably will. Um, in terms of our Asia-Pacific performance, uh, it was good vis-a-vis -vis 2019, but I would remind you that we did have a pretty weak fourth quarter uh, that we were comparing to. So while business uh, is improving there, we definitely need to see strength globally to get uh, maximum performance out of uh, China because a lot of their uh, work, of course, gets exported. Then last quarter, I believe you talked about being surprised if industrial and process demand did not kind of move together. The process does seem to be lagging here. So do you expect sales there to bounce back as we've seen in industrial? Yeah, you know, I would say that I was a little bit surprised, but not terribly, because within process, uh, we've got some segments that have felt more pain than others, and particularly I reference the vehicle services and the oil and gas industries. And so they're, they're actually taking the, the average in that uh, process segment down, and so we need to see some recovery there. And then if I could, just one last question. Similar to the question on batteries, there's been a lot of talk in the auto industry about the amount of capital needed to support electric vehicle production. Have you looked into what that opportunity means for Graco? Thank you. Yeah, you know, a lot of our uh, applications in automotive are going to be the same, whether the car has uh, got uh, gas engine in it, diesel engine in it, or an electric uh, motor in it. Uh, we do a lot of seam sealing, we do bonding, we do sound deadening, we do anti-flutter, we do light weighting activities, um, obviously we do uh, finishing systems. So those necessarily aren't um, driven by just what's happening with the drivetrain. We're trying to capitalize where we can in markets like battery that Mark uh, gave you a nice summary on. Um, and we don't today get a lot of uh, work on the actual drivetrain itself. We don't sell a lot into direct drivetrain manufacturing, so I don't view the switch to electric vehicles as to being a, a major uh, change in the business for Graco. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next question will come from like a line of Mike Holland from Baird. You may begin. Good morning, everyone. Um, Good morning, Mike. 
Uh, just a quick clarification on I think Dean's last question. So Pat, you're saying price cost positive um, is still is still what you guys are angling despite the inflation, and and still thinking about a more normal price increase. Well, I talked about what I thought a realized price increase would be. We are definitely seeing uh, some commodity inflation, uh, and how that's all going to play out, I'm not sure. Um, with some volume, I think our factories are going to perform, so I feel pretty good. Uh, on the overall cost side, despite the fact that we'll probably get some commodity pressure. Um, and the other thing that I would point out is, is that historically, when we see commodity pressure, we have good year, years of good top-line performance. Um, that mm -hmm. tends to get a lot of things going that uh, are in our wheelhouse. So uh, while I'd love to have strong top-line and commodities getting weak, typically we don't see that, and I think it's actually a positive sign. Nope, that's helpful. And then maybe some uh, context on the industrial segment. Um, really two things here. One, sustainability of, of the momentum that you saw kind of sequentially through the quarter. Um, obviously a little different sequentially on the revenue line versus what the order trend seems to be. But maybe some thoughts there and any specifics on end markets, auto, anything else of size that, that you think is moving the needle one way or another? Uh, yeah, Mike, the Business tempo in industrial obviously did get better in, in Q4, but, you know, we, we hope uh, it continues here uh, as we get into the first half of the year. Profitability was way up, as you saw, in Q4. Some mm -hmm. of that was due to just the fact that we had some lower spending um, as a result of COVID. I, I would expect that as our teams get back out on the road and we start, you know, re-engaging with customers and, and moving around that we'll be spending more and also um, the incentives, you know, for that particular segment haven't been great uh, this year with business being down. So there's going to be a, a normal uptick in spending. Hopefully the volume uh, tracks with that. It should, um, and that we're able to put up, you know, decent operating margin performance here in, in 21. Helpful. And then last one. Um, I'm sure the answer probably hasn't changed a heck of a lot here, but just thoughts on the M&A environment from your perspective and actionability as you see it today? Still expensive, and while we'd like to do something bigger, my guess is, is what you'll see is uh, niche-type things that we can leverage into either existing businesses or that we think we can build on. And I, I wouldn't anticipate in this environment that you should bank too much on anything big happening. Makes sense. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Our next question will come from the line of Brian Blair from Oppenheimer. You may begin. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Brian. Good morning. So a couple of follow-up questions. Uh, I apologize if I missed some of the detail in uh, prior responses. Uh, starting with the industrial rebound in uh, Asia-Pacific, uh, admittedly versus a you know, weak comp last year, uh, how much of that was driven by automotive lift? And how does that uh, sector momentum, uh, if we're correct in, in that read, factor into the, the six-week booking rate to, to kick off 2021? Yeah, Brian, we don't break out the automotive portion of the business. It's Number one, it's really hard to quantify it. We sell through distribution, and then we don't exactly know where stuff goes. Um, and number two, just for competitive reasons, we don't think it's a good thing to do if we had the data available. So I would characterize it as more of a broad-based recovery across the industrial product categories. Um, as you mentioned, um, the comparison was really pretty, uh, pretty low for them in Q4. I think last year industrial was down somewhere around 26 or 28 percent in Q4, so they made a you know, comeback. Um, and on a full-year basis, uh, Asia is down 1 percent, but you know, for the full year last year, or Asia was down about 19% last year on a full year basis. So um, we're encouraged by the momentum that we're seeing, um, but you know, hopefully, um, you know, the business continues, the temple stays, and, and we should see you know decent year here in 2021. Got it. Okay, and then on process trends and then the areas of sustained pressure there, um, you know, the, the lubrication business and, and oil and gas, uh, I. I guess to address the the second uh, first, I I believe oil and gas exposure is very modest following your your Alco divestiture. Uh, is that correct? And then 
with lubrication, I would assume that you have some sequential momentum there, but perhaps I'm, I'm overlooking the timing of spending. Any color would be helpful. Yeah, so we're, we don't want to break out the you know, sequential momentum by individual product line within a segment that just takes us into no man's land, so I'm not going to go there. On the oil and gas side, uh, you're correct. Our direct oil and gas exposure is not large. Uh, however, indirect oil and gas exposure uh, can be meaningful meaning that we sell into industries that are also do well when oil and gas does well. So we would like to see some sustainability of uh, the kind of the recent uptick in uh, oil prices. And I think if that can happen over a period of time, we'll see some uh, reinvestment and that should help us across uh, a number of our business lines. Okay. Appreciate the color. Thanks again. And our next question will come from the line of Jeff Hamon from QBank. You may begin. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Um, just on contractor, if you look um, at kind of the bookings, you know, mix and, and what you're hearing from customers, do you expect kind of the, the smaller and the home center to continue to be strong and in, in way on mix, or, or what, what are you thinking there? Yeah, it's kind of hard to predict, but, I mean, that's what we've experienced recently. Um, I think that, you know, it, in my time here at Graco, I've never seen anything like we've seen here in the last six or eight months on many fronts. Uh, and so, you know, we're not trying to predict the future, and we've withdrawn sort of our forward-looking guidance. But uh, what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing, I believe that both um, the, the paint channel uh, and the home center channel uh, are likely to remain favorable markets for us as we move through 21 here. Okay, great. And then um, just on the, the six-week booking, you know, back on industrial, is that is that growth pretty broad-based geographically, or is that still being driven kind of heavily by the, the Asia pack? Yeah, I think it's I think it's more or less uh, broad-based, Jeff. I don't think I don't think there's any one particular region that's uh, standing out more than the others. Okay, thanks a lot. And our next question will come from the line of Joe Ritchie from Goldman Sachs. You may begin. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hey, Joe. Hey, Pat, maybe, um, maybe just starting off, can you just tell us a little bit about how your parts and accessories business trended throughout the quarter versus um, maybe like new equipment sales? Yep, no, it looked right in line uh, with how it always looks, which is not surprising because um, that's how it always looks, but... I think we're fine there. Okay, so yeah, I, I guess the question is really trying to trying to get a sense of for whether um, maybe you know like break and fix is is uh, is is trending better than than new. But, you, but what I'm sensing is is basically trending trending in line with each other. Is that is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, and you can go back. It's it's pretty amazing, and you can go back in time and quarter by quarter and year by year, and it doesn't vary more than a point or two. So it's it's really pretty steady, and I think there's there's more than more reasons for that than just what's happening at the end market level. You have to keep in mind that um, you know we ship our products pretty much same day. We have some products we don't, but the vast majority of our products an order comes in and it gets shipped out. So what the local distributors need to carry is they need to carry the service and repair parts that are needed to be able to take care of their customer, and so they'll typically carry inventory on service parts and then they'll typically order the larger, more expensive items on an as-needed basis. So I think that kind of uh, kind of has an accumulator effect, a dampening effect on what we see in our parts and accessories business um, because distributors carry stock. Got it. Okay. And then maybe just kind of following on the, you know, maybe just the margin question for, for industrial, like obviously the incremental margins this quarter were, were extremely strong. Um, and you guys didn't take a lot of discretionary actions in uh, in 2020. So, like, how, how should we be thinking about the the incremental margin in industrial in, in, in 2021? Yeah, I'd say like what we've always said, um, Joe. If we can get that, you know, mid single digit or higher top line growth rate, we should be in the above 40 percent incremental margins for that business, that segment. Okay. Was there any, and was there anything unusual that that impacted um, the fourth quarter? Because uh, you were in that mid single digit range, but that the incrementals were, were much stronger than that. Yeah, I think the biggest 
the biggest couple things I'd mentioned, one, currency definitely helped on the gross margin line, but also just the absolute level of spending that we had um, and the fact that we didn't have as much volume and um, earnings-based expenses in the P&L in Q4 versus uh, what we would have had a year ago, I think those are the major factors. Got it. Great. If I could maybe sneak one more. The 53-week year, I guess just sales and margins um, impact, I mean, is, is it just as simple as thinking of like a two-point impact in sales and, you know, is, is it any impact to margins from, from the extra week? I'm going to jump back for a second to your prior question. and Just, to, you know, in general, when you're looking at our different segments, looking at uh, incremental margins quarter to quarter, I think, is less instructive than looking at them on an annual basis because lots of things can make them jump around. So I think if you're really trying to figure out what's going on with incremental margins, you'll serve yourself well by looking at the kind of the annual numbers. On your second question, the 53rd week, that's a always a big debate internally here too. What is that 53rd week worth? Is it worth two days? Is it worth five days? Which which days are they? You know, are they busy business days or are they between Christmas and New Year's? So, um, you know, I, I can't give you an actual answer on that. And if you ask five business leaders at Graco, you'd probably get five little bit different answers. So <laughs> it's probably somewhere between one for one and two percent on the top line. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, guys. And our next question will come from the line of Matt Somerville from DA Davidson. You may begin. Thanks. Uh, good morning. Just uh, well, one question here. Most of mine have been answered. Is, is we think about, um, is there a way to think about how much lack of accessibility to facilities has hindered Graco's top line? And the reason I ask is in the context of, you know, theoretically this vaccine sort of ramps up, maybe that tempers. Um, the, the the accessibility issue for you guys, and you see some release in pent-up demand. Is there a way you guys are thinking about that? I don't think it's measurable, um, meaning I don't think there's any way we can measure it. Um, certainly, we believe that not getting our salespeople in front of customers uh, is hurting our top line. We don't get a chance to push the new products. Uh, we don't get to be proactive, walking through factories, looking for opportunities to sell something that maybe the customer didn't even know that they wanted. Um, you know, you got a lot of the engineering folks that be working from home, which I think is less effective. So there's an impact there, but how to measure that, I really have no idea. I think that to the extent that we start to see the world loosen up, we're going to feel better about our opportunities, and we should see that uh, in the top line, particularly in the um, industrial and uh, potentially the process segments. And, and we're kind of looking towards maybe the back half of 21 to see some more normalization. As you've been watching in the news right now, depending upon where you're looking in the world, uh, there are different levels of loosening and tightening, and it's really hard to predict really one month to the next. So we're gonna keep doing our job and uh, do the best we can, but we would really like to have access to customers back to a more um, normal process. At some point, Pat, um, you know, I, I guess what would you need to see in your business? And it's great, by the way, that you give, you know, the sales cadence and the six-week order data. Um, I, I, I really like that granularity. At some point, do you think Graco will get back to providing, at least at a high level, some sort of guidance framework? And if so, what do you need to see to be able to do that? Yeah, I think it's likely that we will. I'm not going to promise that we will, but I think it's likely that we will. Um, but we just need to have confidence that, what we're telling you has got something behind it. And right now, anybody who thinks that they can predict what the world's going to look like in three or four months is probably, it's probably a coin flip or a swag or whatever. And we try to be a little bit more finite with our guidance than just taking a guess. So we're just going to hold off here. And I think you have to make some macro calls when you take a look at the world and you take a look at what's happening with other industrial companies and what's happening with macro data and what's happening with COVID and try to make some, some call on your own because uh, from our standpoint, it's, it's pretty much of a wild card. Got it. Thanks, Pat. And our next call will come from line of Drew Boscalia from Berenberg. You may begin. Morning, guys. Morning. Good morning. Um, I was hoping you could, um, you know, can you, can you give some indication, you know, around margin expansion potential in 2021? Because it's, there's a lot of puts and takes and that costs are going up. It seems like you're going to have 
pricing, offsetting some of that, and you're going to face really tough comps in contractor even on the margin side. So where, I guess, where is the juice for margin expansion next year, or this year, rather? So I think the positive view is with commodity prices going up, typically that would indicate that things are going to be good on the industrial side of our business, and obviously we've got great incremental margins on the industrial side. Um, what we saw in 2020 was the contractor growth really carried the organization, um, lower overall margins, uh, and uh, really pressure on process industrial on the top line uh, created some challenges for us on the operating margin. So, you know, I think as you see uh, industrial and process pop back, you're going to see those 40% plus kind of incremental uh, operating margins that are going to drive nice profitability for Graco. I'd really like to see those in the you know, high single digits, which would not be unusual at all for uh, recovery. Um, we see recovery in the past, uh, getting high single digit growth out of our industrial business is, has been something that we've seen. Um, I think it's more uh, of a question about when than if. I expect it to come back, um, but I just don't know exactly when. Um, obviously, signs short term are looking positive, and we like that, um, but uh, I think there's still some uncertainty the next uh, half year or so here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and you're and Pat, you're kind of in a pickle with um, use of cash here because you know it sounds like M and A's tough valuation wise. You know your stock's not exactly cheap, so you can't really you know, a big buyback is probably unlikely. I don't know. Where do you? How are you thinking about use of cash? And uh, you know with these with M and A, would not would when you guys be able to find some accretion just given kind of where you're where your valuation is relative to the companies you're buying? So I think one of the keys during times like this is to be patient. Right? We don't have, uh, you know, I don't have any hair, but if I did, it wouldn't be on fire right now because of the amount of cash that we have in the in the bank. <laughs> um, that provides us some nice opportunity to do something. We continue to be active and looking for M&A opportunities. Um, I was just suggesting really that if you're building a model, I wouldn't put it in there. Um, we're not going to go out and do something just because we have a pile of cash. Our shareholders expect us to invest that and get a good return, and um, they don't expect us to go and just blow it off the balance sheet immediately on a poor return investment when a little bit of patience could be in order. So we're going to do like we've always done, and we're going to be opportunistic. Uh, if we see opportunities to buy our stock back at what we think are – uh, good uh, good prices, and we're going to look for M&A opportunities. We're going to invest back in the business and new product development and uh, automation and other cost reduction projects, and the Graco, uh, Graco program is going to continue, and hopefully we'll continue to put up results like we have in the past. But, yeah, I don't feel any urgency on it. All right, got it. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question will come from line of Walter Liptak from Seaport Global. You may begin. Hey, thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I uh, wanted to ask about industrial, and I guess, the you know, it's good to see sort of these early signs of recovery, especially in that six-week um, uh, bookings number. And I wonder if, as you looked at the data, was there anything that stood out to you, uh, like geographically or by industrial sector, um, you know, that you could, uh, you know, uh, you know, might give us some insight into uh, what's going on in the industrial sectors. No, as Mark alluded to on an earlier question, it seems to be spread out, not just all concentrated in one spot. Uh, and again, when you see what's happening with uh, commodities, that would kind of indicate that there's some some reason for optimism here. So we'll have to, we need a little bit longer time before we're going to get bullish on it, but I would say that we feel positive about where we're at versus where we were at six months ago. Okay. Is it, um, you know, any thoughts about is this new capacity that's coming online or um, is it capacity upgrades because of new products? Well, the world has been producing, but, you know, there's been some interesting dislocations out there in the marketplace, and then there, of course, have been lots of... Um, I'll say unusual situations just in terms of uh, employees at work and what are they doing. And, you know, I feel lucky for Greco as an organization. Our engineering groups have remained very active. Um, they've, been, they've been on site. They've been getting the job done. We've been investing in capital equipment and buying robots and automation. But certainly that hasn't been the case. Uh, there have been um, lots of 
factories where they're hanging in there and they're doing what they need to do to get by, but they're minimizing the number of uh, resources that they have on the ground and um, definitely uh, puts a damper on industrial capex. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very unusual situation and it's pretty fluid and I'm not sure exactly what it's going to take to get it back, but I would say that the likelihood that a six months worth of vaccines changes things, at least in key markets in Western Europe and the U.S., seems to be favorable. Okay. Okay. And, um, you know, just thinking about those six-week orders again, you know, as you look through those, uh, is the timing of shipments stretched out, uh, or is this stuff that will go in early in the year? Uh, for installation? So we have some uh, businesses within industrial that have run on backlog and longer lead time, but you know, my, I, I haven't parsed the six-week numbers, so I can't give you an exact thing, but my sense is is that it looks pretty much like it typically does. Yeah, and I would just add that, you know, the six weeks is a, is a pretty short time period, so, you know, there's some danger involved in trying to extrapolate those numbers. There's systems jobs in there. There's some lumpiness both positive and negative. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Okay. Well, it's good to see it. So, okay. Yep. Thanks, guys. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> and if there are no further questions, I'll now turn the conference over to Pat McHale. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for your uh, participation here today. Um, thanks to all the employees for the great job that you did in the quarter. And uh, we're going to start... 2021 out with a little bit of momentum and we're going to do our best uh, to have uh, a decent year. So with that, we'll sign off. This concludes our conference for today. Thank you all for participating and have a nice day. All parties may now disconnect.